Welcome everyone to our Biodiversity and Pollinators Session 5 webinar. My name's Tristan and I'm a teacher at Observatory Hill Environmental Education Centre and it's wonderful to have you here today as we're going to be talking about a very special pollinator today. We have our teachers Nicole and also Glenn is here with us today so we've got lots of fun things to do as we learn about biodiversity and pollinators. I'd like to start, we're making an acknowledgement of country. Observatory Hill Environmental Education Centre is located on Gabrigal land. So I'd like to acknowledge ancestors past and present and emerging and from any people joining us today from Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander descent, welcome to our webinar. As you know, we are a Department of Education school, so we observe the Department of Education code for students whilst we're working in our webinars. Observatory Hill Environmental Education Centre values kindness and positive participation. For your safety, you won't be able to turn on your video or microphone this afternoon. And there's also no Q&A, but there will be the opportunity to ask a question in your evaluation survey at the end. So if you have any questions as you're watching, make sure to write them down and you can ask any of those questions at the end. We will publish the answers and we do publish the answers to any questions we receive and those are on our website. So if you look up the Observatory Hill Environmental Education Centre online learning and go into our biodiversity and pollinators section, you will see the questions and your and the answers to your questions. So that'd be great for you to have a look up at. We're going to start today with a quick poll about you and I know this is a little bit different to how we're normally doing it but just let's have a look about you. We'd love to know and I realise that some of you are now sitting in class groups with your teachers which is great so thank you very much teachers for bringing students in today. Which group are you in? Are you an individual student, a teacher or you are here with the whole class? And what year are you in? Are you in kindergarten, year one or two, three or four, five or six, seven or eight, or again, are you a teacher by yourself watching this? And what are you interested in learning about? This was really helpful for us to develop our webinar series over this lockdown period. Are you interested in animals, the environment, nature, history or geography or other things? And how many people are watching with you today? Is it just you or are you here with your whole class? Fantastic, great work guys. Okay, I'm going to end that poll. It looks like we've got a group, we've got a class here. We might be three, four or five, six. And we've got some students here as well. Great to see you, welcome this afternoon. Um, I can see that people are interested in learning about animals. Well, you're going to have a great afternoon. I'm sure you're going to learn something today. The environment and nature. Well, I think we've got something in this presentation for you for sure. And I can see people are there with their whole class and also with themselves or with two other people. So welcome today. Thanks so much for joining us. Okay, let's continue on. And I'm going to introduce Nicole. Hi, Tristan. Thanks so much. Hello, everybody. It's great to be here with you this afternoon. And we're continuing our learning about biodiversity and pollinators. And if you've been with us so far in any of our other sessions, you'll know there is so much to learn. And I'm really excited about today's webinar because I think it's going to be a learning about an animal that many people have different views on. So we really hope, as always, you can take away some great facts and exciting information that you can share with your family and friends. So let's go back a little bit just to make sure we're coming from all the right understanding. And we had some really excellent questions trying to understand further the relationship between pollinators, pollination and reproduction of flowers, making more flowering plants. So let's go back to what is pollination. This image we can see here, which is really well labeled, and some of those words seem a bit tricky, but it's a really good outline of the parts of a flower. And we can see here, although not the only pollinator, it's one that's very familiar to many people, which is a European honeybee. And we can see the European honeybee doing the job of pollination. They have special sacs on their legs to be able to move pollen from one flower to another. So they are very successful pollinators. And we can 
see here how that movement of pollen is moving from one part of one flower to another part of the other. So from the anther of one to the stigma of the other. And that's really important to observe and understand that movement of pollen so we can then understand how these flowering plants are making more of themselves and the critical roles pollinators play. So after this happens, we can see on the next slide, <clears throat> once the pollen has moved from one, from one part of a flower to the other part of the flower, which is called fertilization. That's the beginning of fertilization. And we can see here even more detail of the inside of the flower where we're looking at the ovary. So essentially we're talking about bringing the male and female parts of, fertile, of, of flowers, flowering plants together so that they can reproduce. We can see here that once the pollen is transferred to the stigma, it moves down the pollen tube into the ovary and that sets in motion the process that enables that plant to create the fruit through the, with the seeds inside. So really important, it's like flicking a switch. The pollination process, moving that pollen, getting that to the right part of the flower is flicking that switch to enable fertilization and then for the plant to be able to start making more of themselves. So that's really pretty amazing. So much detail there and it's happening all around us. I love this image here because I was looking to show you some examples of other pollinators, of course, aside from the European honeybee or bees at all, pollinating. And the one up in the middle there at the top is a flying fox covered in pollen. So we talked before about how there's some pollinators who are intentional, like your European honeybee and other bees, where they are going for a sweet drink of nectar and to specifically collect pollen to take back to their homes and their families. But there are other animals that can be considered to be incidental pollinators. They're coming for a nice sweet drink, but the clever flowers that have evolved with these pollinators over a long period of time have found ways Ways of spreading the pollen on the body of that animal so that when they move to the next flower that pollen will fall off on the right part of that flower enabling it to fertilize and reproduce. So this beautiful image of the flying fox up in the middle covered in pollen is just amazing and that's our focus today. So yes flying foxes and bats are pollinators. Lots of people are not aware of that. And we know, and we chose flying foxes because many people have got some negative ideas about flying foxes, but actually they are so amazing and really, really important for our ecosystems and environment. I feel really lucky. I live next to a park that has a lot of flying foxes and I get to watch them come out at nighttime, going to go on their journey, looking for food and spreading pollen. So we're gonna be focusing on the gray-headed flying fox. It's the largest of Australia's flying foxes. It has a wingspan of up to one meter, has gray fur and an orange ring around its neck. So there's a couple of beautiful images there and I'm sure you recognize them. <clears throat> Amazingly, flying foxes are mammals just like us. So that's pretty amazing to be a mammal. You're warm blooded, your body's covered in hair and you feed milk from your mother. Just like we do, the same it is for flying foxes. So it's amazing how much we actually do have in common. And it's incredible to think that here in Australia, the variety of pollinators we have includes mammals like the flying fox. So, Nicole, we actually have a, bit, a poll here about yeah. mammals. So let's cross over to our poll, shall we, and find out what our participants know about mammals. Great. So there's one question here. And the question is, which of the following animals are indeed mammals? Now, Nicole's given us a big clue already. We do know the flying fox is a mammal. But what about a human, a lion, a dog, or is the answer to this question actually all of the above? Well done, guys. You're doing really well. I'll give you a little bit more time. That's great. Thank you for participating in our polls. That's fantastic. It's great to see you all there listening and, oh, fantastic. So I can see here that, and I'll share that result with you, that four out of five of you got that right. Well done. 
all of those animals are indeed mammals. Flying foxes are mammals, humans are mammals, lions are mammals, dogs, all of the above are mammals. That's great. Thanks, guys. Well done. Nicole, I'll go on to the next slide for you. Thanks so much, Tristan, and well done, everybody. It really is just such a fascinating world and so much to learn. So it'll help you think of those animals a little differently next time. They're just like us in so many ways. So there are four different species of flying foxes across Australia, and two of those species are found uh, nowhere else in the world. And that is the gray headed flying fox and the little red flying fox. So nowhere else in the world, but in Australia, which is pretty amazing. The other two you can see there, the black flying fox and the speckled flying fox are in respectively uh, Queensland and New Guinea uh, as well. So that's really interesting to know too. And look how differently their faces look to each other. That's also so fascinating. So that's amazing. So the two that we have, uh, endemic in Australia here and found nowhere else. Looking at a map of what that looks like, because you might then be able to relate to wherever you are watching from, and now you'll know what you're looking at when you look up at the night sky, or maybe you're lucky enough to be in one of those areas there that actually have a few different types of flying foxes living where you are. So that's really very interesting looking at what's called the distribution, the spread of those different species of flying foxes across various parts of Australia. And maybe it's worth doing a bit of investigating as to why it is that they're not found in certain parts of Australia, like down there in Tasmania. So that's something to think about. Looking a little closer at our grey headed flying fox, which we're focusing on today, we can see here in this image a number of features that help us to recognise them and also to appreciate about their incredible evolution. So yes, they've got ears, so they've got big ears for listening with, they've got these clawed thumbs, and uh, that's for various things, of course, how they use them, uh, they can even climb with them, which is pretty amazing if you've ever seen that. And also we know that little baby uh, bats are born with an extra little thumb claw that helps them to grip onto their mum while she's flying. So she can continue to go looking for food, even with the baby hanging onto her belly. So they hang upside down, as we can see. We've got, we can see their lovely bone structure there, their wingspan we talked about, and of course those feet, those amazing feet that hold on to the limbs of trees, which is how they spend the majority of their lives upside down like that. I'm really excited to actually show you now with Glenn, who's going to give us a bit more detail about the flying fox and parts of their body. Over to you, Glenn. Thanks, Nicole. Uh, Tristan, if you want to just stop sharing that, that'd be great. And I'll just uh, pin myself so I can see a little bit better. Fantastic. So welcome everyone. My name's Glenn and I'm the principal of the Observatory Hill Environment Centre. And behind me, I have an example of a taxidermid, taxidermid flying fox specimen. So a taxidermist is somebody who takes dead animals and preserves them for scientific purposes so that people can see them up close. They often work in places like museums. And I'm sure if you've been to a museum, you would have seen what we normally just call stuffed animals. So this is a flying fox, which is mounted on some sticks to show you what it would look like. And as Nicole said, this flying fox has a wingspan of one meter. So it's a mammal, it's covered in fur. It does have this brown collar around its neck. And that's why the early European settlers in Australia called it a flying fox. It's not really a fox, it's not related to a fox, but it does have a very reddish brown collar, um, which looks like a fox. Um, so you can see its wings, um, which are really actually like hands. So it has the same structure as our hands, but just obviously quite different because they're much uh, longer. These uh, leathery uh, wings um, are quite strong although mine is a little bit fragile because it is dried out and so it tends to tear um, very easily. But you saw the, the um, claws here that Nicole mentioned. If I flip that up, you can see that. 
and it is uh, it does have fur right down to the bottom of its legs, right down to the bottom here, which is an egg, which is a trait or a characteristic of this um, species of flying fox. All right, and you can see the fur on its back there. So, like Nicole said, um, most people think that these use echo sounding or radar. Well, they actually have really good smell and they actually have really good eyesight. So they've got quite big eyes for the size of their head or body for a mammal. And so, yes, they can um, see things at night and they can smell things as well. They obviously have these really great claws to hang on and they can hang upside down. I'll move that in a bit. So you can see that they can hang upside down all day um, on those claws. Now the babies are born just like human babies are born. And as Nicole said, they have special claws. And if I, I don't know if I can turn this around so that you can see under here, there's a special teat, um, which is just under its wing there. All right, which is where the baby flying fox would attach itself to. So when it's born, it attaches itself to that special teat um, it has special claws that hang on to the fur and special teeth that grab onto the teeth. So from one to um, three weeks, the baby is actually flying around with the mother. But after three weeks, the baby stays in the um, colony, which is the large group of flying foxes. And then the mother would go out foraging at night for food and bring it back to the baby. So the babies are looked after by some of the other flying foxes. After about three months, the babies are old enough to take off and fly with their mothers as well. So a pretty amazing animal. It's adapted um, to live in the Australian environment. As Nicole mentioned, it's very good at pollination because when it is getting the nectar and the flowers with its nose, it can cover its whole face with um, pollen. And then of course, when it goes to another plant, it's spreading that pollen from the stigma to the anther, which is how reproduction starts. And for many Australian plants, especially in the Australian rainforests, these are one of the few animals that actually do pollination. So it's really important that we look after our grey-headed flying foxes. And unfortunately, they are classified as a threatened species. The reason is that um, there are lots of things that can threaten the survival of this animal. In 10 years alone, from 1990 to 2000, the population dropped almost 30%. So one third of the entire population died and they died of lots of different reasons. Um, some of the key ones are things like feral animals like dogs, uh, people putting um, nets over their fruit trees and their feet get tangled in the nets. And then of course they can't fly away and they die. They can get electrocuted on a power line. But the really big threat that um, is really a, a big concern is climate change. Because grey-headed flying foxes can't really stand very hot days. And if you see on the news a day that's really hot, like maybe 43 degrees or something like that, many of these animals just die. They fall out of the tree and die on the ground because it's too hot for them. They're not very um, adapted to surviving in extremely hot days. And because of climate change, we're seeing a lot hotter days. So um, we'll talk a little bit more about their um, threats later on. Nicole will mention some more, but I just wanted to show you up close a really good example of a grey-headed flying fox, which is a taxidermied specimen. You can see him really close there. And um, yeah, hopefully you might see one in your area. Okay, back to you. Thanks, Tristan and Nicole. Thanks, Nicole. Oh, sorry. Thanks, Glenn. That was fantastic. Lots of information there. Let's continue on with our presentation from Nicole. Amazing. Thank you so much, Glenn. What a pleasure to see that up close like that and hear your incredible knowledge about our grey-headed flying foxes. 
Now, as Glenn was talking about with the flying fox's ability to spread pollen, absolutely their face can be covered as we saw. But the other incredible thing about them too is they are our furthest flying pollinator. So they travel long, long distances spreading the seed and spreading the pollen. Of course, they also are nocturnal. So they're one of our nocturnal pollinators. So doing the important job of pollination through the night. So the pollination is happening all the time. So we, as Glenn mentioned particularly with rainforests when we're seeing what's called fragmented areas of rainforest meaning they're not connected as they once were they've been broken up perhaps by development roadworks other reasons for removing habitat which is another threat to the flying fox they are fragmented so many of the pollinators that don't travel as long distances really struggle to be able to move from one area to another but flying foxes again with the distances they can travel they are able to still pollinate over those fragmented areas so thank goodness for them they also like to follow the uh, pattern, the, the flowering times of particularly paper bark and eucalyptus forests along the east side of Australia, as we saw on the map there. So that's something to consider too next time you're looking up at the top of the flowering paper bark or eucalyptus to wonder when that flying foxes might be coming to visit any near your place. So really amazing facts about flying foxes, so critically important for our environment. Over to you with a lovely video to show everyone, Tristan. Thanks, Nicole. That was great. And we, and we are going to cross over now to our video looking at a colony of flying foxes in Sydney at the Royal Botanic Gardens. And we get some up-close footage here. okay that was great so let's just think about some of the things that we saw there on our video and see did you notice because i noticed that it was a daytime video and i always thought that the bats were nocturnal but we do know that although that bats are nocturnal, which means that they sleep in the day and hunt for food at night, that they still do a lot of their general business during the day. And things like grooming and feeding their babies would be considered general business for bats. So we did see that as we were watching the video today. They were still making a lot of noise and they were supposed to be asleep. And these bot bats were making noise as they were talking to each other. As bats live in communities or camps, they share information like where they have been in the night and where to find good food. So they are communicating with each other during the day. Some bats were stretching and flapping their wings, but not actually flying. And as Glenn mentioned, they are very susceptible to heat and they have difficulty regulating their heat. But one way they do regulate their body heat is by flapping their wings to cool their body. So they actually will flap their wings to cool themselves. Now, there, was a, there were some mother bats, and I know Glenn's spoken about that, with babies attached or holding onto their bodies. And the baby bat, which is called a pup, is bald and blind at, bat, at birth. And it's actually born alive, as, as Glenn mentioned, just like a real a human baby is born alive. The mother will carry the baby on her chest for the first few weeks of its life. And before leaving, it, and before that, she will then leave it into a communal nursery, as Glenn mentioned. So that the nursery is also like a roost and other bats will look after the baby whilst the mother will go out and forage for food. The pups will start learning to fly at three months, but they'll remain dependent on their mothers until they're around six months old. 
and they're very a very close community so they'll stay together now there was mention before about different diseases and about bats being unsafe so we do know that bats are susceptible to a couple of different types of viruses which can in rare occasions be spread to people. So we do have some rules or some ideas about keeping safe when we're looking at bats or looking after bats. And I think my number one rule would definitely be make sure if you see a bat that's in trouble, rather than actually trying to help it yourself, actually call a professional. And there are professional people in wires who look specifically after bats and specifically after our grey-headed flying foxes. Remember, if you see an animal that has been injured or hurt, ask for help from an official, an official carer rather than helping them yourselves. So one way that a virus can be spread from a person or from a human, sorry, from a bat to a human is by touching either claws or saliva from the bat. And you can imagine if a bat has been injured, it is a wild animal and it would be very scared. It would be unfortunate for you to get hurt while you're trying to help that animal. So remember, rather than touching the animal yourself, always get professional help from that. And there's wires and there is some information about um, wires on our website. Nicole, I'm gonna go back over to you. Have you got something else to tell us about bats? Thanks so much, Tristan. That was a great video. I could watch those all day. I do, there's so much information to share with you. Uh, so we're also thinking about, as we said, that they are uh, really uh, lo long distance pollinators, loving the eucalyptus forest, as we can see here, some examples of different flowers they're pollinating, and they can actually travel to up to 50 kilometers of land in one night. So one of their journeys when they're ready to go at nighttime, and they take off from the tree, and they skim their bellies on some water as a drink for the night, they can travel up to 50 kilometers in one night pollinating. That's just incredible. Bees also are what we call keystone, sorry, bats are keystone pollinators, meaning that they are a species that many plants and animals rely on for their survival. So always we need to remember when we're talking about any animal in particular or pollinators as a group, they all form part of a very complex uh, group of occurrences, things happening, things that need to be connected to each other, interdependencies is a big word, but meaning they are all relying on each other. And so flying foxes really play a critical part in that bigger picture of healthy ecosystems. They're able to pollinate over 50 different native trees. So that's really quite an incredible feat for these amazing animals. Tristan, do we have another poll for our participants? Yes, indeed, we do have another poll. So let's just have a look at that now. Let's find out what do you know about how far bats will actually be able to travel. So flying foxes, how far can the flying fox travel in one night? Who can remember what Nicole said? Is it around five kilometers, around 50 kilometers, around 500 kilometers or around 5,000 kilometers? Now, this is a really important point because a native bee can actually only travel around five metres. So that's not really very far at all. Whereas an, a European honeybee can travel up to three kilometres. And I can see there that most of you have answered that poll now. Well done. I'm going to give you a few more moments to answer. That's great. But indeed, you are all correct there, and I can see you've got it, that the flying fox can actually travel around 50 kilometres in one night. So that's a massive distance. When we consider and compare it to some of our other pollinators, they are travelling such a great, huge distance, and it's a very important job that they are doing. Thanks, Nicole. I'll go back to you now. Jen, it's a really great perspective when we think about those incredible distances that they travel. And I love this image here on the top right, which I get to see most nights of this enormous population 
of these grey-headed flying foxes leaving uh, the park near me, just like that in the evening. So it's beautiful to watch. And as Glenn and Tristan have been talking about, it's amazing to think that these grey-headed flying foxes live in these communities or camps as they're referred to. So they will go off to pollinate and they come back together in the evening, in the uh, in the mornings ready for their sleep and their the other business that uh, Tristan was talking about working together as a community and helping to look after each other so it's a really uh, wonderful thing to see such a community as we've talked about other animals but an animal such as a flying fox living like that too so pretty unique and again their ability to get out at night time to pollinate which is fantastic and as we've talked about before, and it's such a gorgeous image here, just to remind us, of course, that the uh, flying foxes are mammals just like us and have live babies just like us. This gorgeous picture on the top left there. And as sweet as that is and looks to us, that means those flying foxes are needing care by people. So we will talk a bit uh, later about how you can all do something to be helping to make sure that they're surviving and thriving uh, out in nature. Uh, so remembering also that they are again a keystone species So the work that they do and the things that they spend their time doing pollinating their relationships with other animals are absolutely critical for our ecosystems. And as we know, the healthier our ecosystems, the healthier all of us are in our environment altogether. So lots of information to think about with our flying foxes. And I'm really excited now because Glenn's going to be sharing with us a fantastic craft activity you can do at school or at home. Over to you, Glenn. Okay, thanks, Nicole. So what I'm going to do, guys, is I'm going to do some origami. Now, if you looked at our website before you came on this uh, presentation, you would have seen that we are going to do some origami. But if you don't have any paper ready, uh, that's okay because um, we can, you can do it later on. There's also instructions on our website about how to make the origami bat that I'm about to show you now. But if you have a piece of paper, um, you can get that out now and we'll give it a go and see if you can follow along to make an origami bat. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to change my camera over to my um, other camera. I hope I, I hope I can do that. Uh, here we go. There we go. And I'll just pin that one so I can see it a little bit better. Uh, there we go. All right. So I'll just move over here. So guys, you can see that um, I have some paper, and let's have. Oh, there we go. Now this. This paper is an A4 piece of paper, and obviously origami paper is square paper. So if you don't have a piece of square origami paper, you can simply make your own square piece of paper with an A4, uh, simply by, and I'm just going to make sure I get this, simply by folding the corner like this, making a triangle, Okay, and then you can either cut the, this bit off here or you can fold it and tear it. So I'm assuming most of you have an A4 um, piece of paper. So all we need to do is to cut that into a square. You can fold it and tear it if you don't have a pair of scissors. Okay, so we're going to have a piece of origami paper. Now I'm going to use the origami paper because I'm going to make a black flying fox. Last week, when, uh, last time we did this, it was actually just before Halloween. So it was a perfect time. We were making some Halloween decorations. But you can see that I'm going to use my square piece of paper. I hope you all have a square piece of paper ready and we're going to make our origami bat. But like I said, if you don't um, have a piece of paper, you can do it afterwards and follow the instructions. I think there's even a little video on our website to show you how to do it. So the first thing that I'm going to do is I am going to fold my square piece of paper into a triangle. Like this. Okay. Then I'm also going to fold it again into another triangle. like this. Then I'm going to open up the triangle. 
right, the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to fold the long bottom edge up so that it's just about two centimeters from here. This little bit here is about two centimeters. So it sort of looks like a hat. So I've just folded the bottom edge up and I've folded it like that. Okay, the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to fold this little triangle over the top like this. I hope you can see that. So I've just folded that over like that. Now, the next thing I'm going to do with, with this triangle um, sticking out on this side, I'm actually going to fold the whole thing in half. Okay, with the little triangle bit on the outside. Okay, so remember we had this shape and then I'm going to fold it like this. So the triangle is on the outside there. Okay, now here comes the hardest part. What we're going to do now is we are going to make a fold. And if I put this up a little bit closer so that you can see. So there's the triangle on the outside. I'm going to fold it from the edge of the triangle here down to this corner. All right, so from this edge here down to this corner. So if you can imagine, if I put a ruler, I'm folding it like that. So if I start there, and I'm going to fold this this way. Okay, so from the edge down to this corner here. And then I'm going to do it the same on the other side. So I really just need to fold that in half like that. So we're getting this shape. Okay, now that is the trickiest part. So I hope you were able to follow along there. Um, so remember, it's from that edge down to that corner, folding it like that, and then folding the whole thing like that. Okay. The last thing we're going to do is we're going, so we've got these two sort of flappy bits at the top and we can see the corner here, right? So our line is going across here. We're going to just take this and fold it this way so that it's sticking out the side. And I'm going to do the same on the other side. So it's sticking out the side that way. So that is our end shape look a little bit like that and when you've done that you basically open it out like this and now we have our flying fox shape which of course if you make a whole lot of them you could run some fishing line through here and pull it up so you could make a mobile a class mobile with your gray-headed flying foxes okay or you can just make your own one um, the instructions are on our website so this is on our website as well as a video on our website. All right, so that's our grey-headed flying fox. Um, last time we made them as um, table napkin decorations for, our, for a Halloween dinner, if you had one on Halloween, but you can make them at any time. So if you like origami, go onto our website and have a look. Okay, that's enough for me. Thanks, uh, Nicole and Tristan, back over to you. Oh, Glenn, I was just thinking they would be a great decoration for Pollinator Week next week. So what a perfect time. Fantastic. Great. Thank you so much for sharing that with us, Glenn. And Nicole, we're going to go back over to you. Oh, actually, no, we're not. We're going to, I'm going to talk for a little bit now. <laughs> Sorry. Um, now, remember, as Glenn's was sh showing you all, there were some videos there on how to actually make the flying fox yourself. So if you don't know where that is, the Observatory Hill Environmental Education Centre website looks like this. And in the middle of the website on the home page is a button called online learning. In the online learning, you can see a section like this one that says biodiversity and pollinators. And if we press on that button, we will end up to have a look at our gallery page. So this is the biodiversity and pollinators website and we have a gallery page. If you make a pollinator, 
this weekend or maybe even this afternoon, you might like to take a photo of that and share it with us. And we'd love to publish some of your pictures. And we do indeed publish work that is sent in into us from any of our biodiversity and pollinator sessions. So if you come into the gallery here, there's a button that says share my work. And from there, you can actually share your work. If you're a Department of Education school, you can upload directly using your website. But if you are not a Department of Education school, if you use our email address and there's information about that on the website, you can send in your pictures and we would gladly publish them on our website. So you can see here, name of your school, name of your year, and then you can upload your photo here. So a simple photo using your digital camera or even your phone or iPad can allow you to upload those pictures. And Nicole, we're going to talk back over to you and you're going to give us a little bit of information about how we can all help the grey-headed flying fox. Thanks, Tristan. Yes, so important. As I said, we all can do something to help, of course course, keeping in mind what Tristan was explaining about the way sometimes sicknesses can be transferred from animals to people. So we need to be mindful of that. But there are some things that we can do without ever having to touch a flying fox to make sure they have the best chance of living their best life, sharing habitats all around where we are. So as we heard uh, from Glenn, there's many threats to our grey-headed flying foxes, as we heard about loss of habitat, heat, power lines, netting and barbed wire being issues. So a few tips there, keep your cat indoors at night time. So that's really important. Cats are naturally hunters, so should always be kept inside at night. They have had a terrible track record of uh, having a really negative impact on lots of our native species. So please be mindful of that with your cat. Also training dogs to stay away from bats, not to bark at them or chase them as they tend to do. Um, rarely they are on the ground unless they are very stressed, but if they happen to be there for other reasons, it's really important we keep our pets away. Also making sure we're planting the right types of trees that the grey-headed flying foxes are looking for. So we're all able to do that, picking the right trees, if we have the right kind of space, or maybe speaking to our council about planting something on the verge that can continue to support our grey-headed flying foxes. Also are uh, using animal safe netting. So next time you are doing that, if you are an avid gardener or your family is at home, ask those questions about making sure you have animal safe netting if you're trying to protect your fruit trees, because after all, the flying foxes are just coming to have a bit of food and a drink as they always do. They don't know who belongs to, to which plant. So think about that. And also, as we said, call a wildlife carer like wires if you see an injured or sick flying fox. So all of these things to think about and we encourage you next time you are out and about, whether it's in the day or the night, you may be close to flying foxes or not. But as we say with all of our webinars, think about being a pollinator. Look around, look for the whether or not an area is biodiverse, has got a lot of variety of food sources and shelter for all of our incredible animals. And now hopefully you know a lot more about our grey-headed flying foxes, have a completely different view if you weren't sure before and can share some great information with your friends and family. Thanks okay. So Thanks so much, Nicole. And Glenn, thank you for your fabulous origami skills today. That was great. I know I learned something. Every time I watch you do that, there's a different thing that I learn. So We'd love to hear from you what you thought about our webinars today. So remember, at the end of this webinar, there is a link for you to actually tell us what you thought of the webinar, but also if you have any questions about anything that you learned today. Remember, those questions will be answered on our Biodiversity and Pollinators website. And don't forget, next week is Pollinators Week, and we will be broadcasting our Biodiversity and Pollinators um, webinars. We'll have recordings of those on our website. So if you've missed any of those episodes so far, and there's lots of fun things to learn and do, please go into our website and find those videos and watch them again. Plenty of things for you to do, teachers, even in class, lots of activities, folding, origami, artwork, lots of information there too. So please join us at any time using our Biodiversity and Pollinators website available through the Observatory Hill Environmental Education Centre website. Okay, and I'm going to say goodbye today. Thanks guys for sharing us. It's been great to be with you this afternoon. Have a great week next week.